Hi, I'm Eric Dalma, pastor at Gospel of Grace Fellowship, and I'm in studio along with Gospel of Grace's theologian and teacher, Bob DeWay. We both want to welcome you here to Critical Issues Commentary Radio, where we dig into the great doctrines of the faith revealed verse by verse through the scriptures, and where we teach you how to contend for the faith once and for all handed down to the saints. Well, Bob, it's great to be with you here in studio. There is actually hope outside the window. We're getting some melting going on. The snow's melting, but we need lots of melting, but we want it to happen slowly. Right. We're in Minnesota here. It's March, and right now as we're recording, there's floods south of here. That's right. And we've had blizzard after blizzard, and now it's melting and yeah, trying to find its way into every basement in, in the city here. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, we have an exciting topic. I know we're going to be continuing on here talking about the Olivet Discourse. And you had mentioned, Bob, that we left off last time in verse 25, um, which puts us in verse 26. And I was just going to mention, for the listener's sake, verses 26 through 29, to summarize what this section's about, it's really about Jesus saying, look, if those people, false teachers, false prophets, during the tribulation period try to claim that I'm here or I'm there, don't believe it, because my parousia, his coming both to rapture the church and to bring salvation for Israel at the end of the 70th week. Um, I'm saying the rapture happens prior to the 70th week. These events are going to be so visible, so obvious, that no one can mistake it. So no one's going to miss the second advent of Christ. Okay, so this implies that some people will claim he's present. Exactly, exactly right. On the earth during the tribulation. That's right. And that's what he warns about earlier, as you and I talked about last time, these false prophets and false Christs that arose. And we had talked about in Revelation 17 how there was going to be not just one Antichrist, but there was going to be ten others with him that end up giving him their power. So there's going to be many false prophets. There's going to be the false prophet, of course, but there's going to be many others as well claiming either to be the Christ or that they know where the Christ is. So during that whole seven-year period, Christ is still reigning in heaven as he is now. Amen. That's right. So the rapture, which we haven't got to that yet. Exactly. We'll come to it. Yeah. Yeah. Brings believers up to be with him. Exactly. But he's still reigning in heaven. Amen. And by the way... Yeah, and just for the listener's sake, there's many passages that teach this. The precedent set in Scripture is that the people of God are removed prior to the wrath coming. So, for example, Noah and his family uh, are removed. And that's why Jesus says the days of the Son of Man will be like the days of Noah. Um, Also in Luke 7, that's in Matthew 24, in Luke 17, Jesus uses the example of Lot and his family. They were also removed prior to the wrath coming. Well, all of this is built also off of Isaiah 26, where God predicts that he is going to take his people into their rooms and hide them while his wrath runs its course. And you can read that in Isaiah 26, 19 through verses, I think, around 22, if I remember correctly. Okay. So this is the precedent set in Scripture that that's how it's going to be. Well, uh I think it's clear enough, but it's amazing. We seem to be in the minority yeah, nowadays. we are. We really are. But why wouldn't we take everything to be literal when that's how it's been always fulfilled? Exactly right. Um, Bob, would you mind reading Matthew twenty four twenty six through 28? I'll do it. So if they say to you, behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. Or, quote, behold, he is in the inner rooms, unquote. Do not believe them. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man be. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Wow. So what's interesting, I think, Bob, is in this section in 27 and 28, Jesus is just simply giving two examples that everyone would be familiar with where something is so obvious that you can't miss it. One is lightning. And the other is the location of a body that's decaying because of the vultures above. So you can't miss it. So you can't miss it. Evidently, some may say, oh, Jesus really is here, but he's over in some right. obscure place in uh, Sinai or whatever. And exactly. It, and, you know, Bob, it ties to me into what you had taught us in First John, because you showed us from First John that one of the key issues 
to knowing who Christ is, is to confess Christ come in the flesh. That's right. one of John's points. What's interesting is that's not only valid for the first advent, it's also valid for the second advent, because when Jesus comes bodily, there's no mistaking it. It's going to be accompanied by clouds of glory, as predicted in Daniel 7. He's going to be with the angels. He's going to be rapturing his elect to meet him in the air. And there's going to be no mistake. No one's going to be able to miss this. And so this is one thing I want to challenge the listener about. Many times people who are fellow pre-trib rapture proponents, like Bob and I are, um, they will claim somehow that this rapture is going to be silent or secret. And Bob and I don't believe that. And the reason why is because of the text here. We think it's going to be very visible. It's going to be very public for all to see. Now, some might say, well, then how do people not all come to faith? Well, the problem is the world in its sinfulness, yeah. even when they see the wrath of God displayed clearly, they know it's God's wrath. They still don't repent. They don't care. Frankly, yeah. when I've heard that argument before, right? we're in Matthew. Yeah, I would just point him to the end of Matthew. What about the guards who saw the angels at the tomb? Great point. They knew better than the disciples what happened at that point in time. Absolutely, and they knew that they had been paid off. Yeah, and they didn't. <laughs> and they didn't say that it didn't happen. They believed it did, but they took money to lie about it. That is a great point. Well, so the claim that well, if something's obvious, everybody will believe it. Right. It doesn't work that way. Yeah, exactly. The, the wickedness of sin is such that people won't believe things even when they've determined that they're true. Yeah. And we've had it happen with some people who've researched whether there's any historical reason to believe in the resurrection of Christ. Yeah. And one such skeptic came to believe that he was raised. Right. But still didn't come to faith. That was shocking. Yeah. Now, what was the title of that book? Who Rolled Away the Stone? Or uh... No, that, no. He came to faith. Okay. This is more recent. That was from 1910. Okay. Uh, but there was a, another guy, and he said, well, it was just for the Jews or whatever. Wow. So even coming to believe it really happened yeah. wasn't enough to create faith. But that didn't shock me because the same thing happened with those people who were guarding the tomb. Wow, wow. Okay, so the hardness of heart is such that it takes a miracle for anybody to be saved. Amen. That's a miracle right. of grace yeah, through the that's gospel. Right. You know, Bob, some years ago you had done a, a conference refuting some of the ideas that were becoming prevalent in evangelicalism that really came from the New Age movement. And one of the partners that you had at your conference was a man named Warren Smith. And what was interesting is he had done a lot of research. He was in the New Age movement, and he himself had seen firsthand sources in the New Age movement that were saying that one day God was going to judge the intolerant by removing them. They'll just say, all the wicked people are gone now. Yeah, exactly. They were the intolerant ones. God got rid this of them. This was part of the universe uh, purging evil. Right, right. I can see people say that because right now we're considered the evil ones. That's right. Because we don't get with the pro process of spiritual evolution that they believe. And I wrote about that in my book. Yes. Called Undefining Christianity about emergent. Right, that's right. So I, we're the sinners. Exactly. Because we don't get with the program. They won't have any problem. So you look at this, the universe, because right now I've noticed by the way, yeah, because I'm teaching through Ephesians here as we're doing this recording. Right. I'm in the middle, when it's my turn to preach, I've been preaching on Ephesians. Yeah. And Ephesus was full of polytheism. Right. There were right. gods and goddesses. Right. Artemis was very prominent there. Yeah. Okay. Well, what we have now is the prevailing pagan worldview in America, anyhow, yeah. is panentheism. Right. Rather than saying there's a goddess Artemis and a god Apollo or this or that. Yeah. Polytheism. They've gone or pantheism, which would just be strict Buddhism, also, although some of them right. are cited by the emergent as well, because I exactly. have a chapter about that. Yeah. The prevailing idea is panentheism, which somehow God is in everything, but somewhat different than just being everything. Yeah, exactly. They try to make some distinction. So maybe like the corporate universe has a mind yeah. and a spirit that's part of this corporate universe. Right. Or the emergence of God is in the future drawing everything to himself. Yeah. So there's an idea of a deity. Yeah. 
But the most prevalent thing I hear is the idea that the universe is this alive, living, spiritual being yes. that does things. Right. And so people, uh, I tell them, I'm, I'm doing very well thanks to the prayers of the saints. Yeah. So I went through a lot of different battles Amen. physically. And uh, thank you, by the way, f- whoever's hearing this that prayed for me. Amen. Because I've had a whole year of health. And s- some people hear me say that. say, oh, don't say that. The universe will hear you. Oh, uh, as if we have to be afraid of that. Well, like the universe is going to dump more sickness on me because the, the universe doesn't like me saying that I'm healthy. Right. But right. I'm just saying God answered the prayers of the saints. Amen. That's right. And you know that he's sovereign. And God is in charge of it anyhow. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm not fearing that I have to knock on wood or... Right. You know, there's somehow karma out there. But see, the society uh, listeners thinks like that. Yes. Okay. They're somewhat different from the Ephesians that you read about in Acts. But not that much. Right, right. Because they had their nature religions and their crazy ideas. Yeah. But it's sort of a panentheism is what they call it. God is in everything. Right, right. And so I could see why they would have no problem explaining the rapture. Yes, that's exactly right. The universe finally got sick of the sinners. (laughs) Yes. Because that's what they think we are. We're resisting the process of moral and spiritual evolution. Great point. And I cite scholars in my book who say that. Yeah. Including McLaren. Right. Okay. That Brian McLaren. Yeah. Bob, that is such a great point. In other words, the paradigm that you're suggesting they have is almost as if being that the universe is God, you know, pantheism or panentheism, it's almost like we're being rejected. Yeah, it's you like know. <laughs> you get rid of the dead weight. Exactly, right. Like fleas off a dog. Yeah, we're get, being get rid of this, so now the right. process can go on. Let me give you even more evidence for that. We've talked about yeah. some of this. What is Babylon in the Old Testament but this desire to ascend yes. into the heavens? Yep, to be like God. And to be like God or to somehow get in contact with the unseen realm of yeah, the spirits. Right. And God dealt with that by confusing languages and creating national boundaries. And we've talked about it. Right. And civil authorities. Yes. Even that, and I was just looking at some of the things I wrote about 10 years ago. Yeah. They're claiming that God hates boundaries. Yes. They're the panentheists. Right. Because all the boundaries are supposedly evolving in this oneness of all things. Right. So here God ordains and, and them. And so then the rapture really happens. Right. And what are they going to get once they get rid of all this evil Christians? Right. They're going to get a boundary. They're going to get world. rid. Of, they're going to get rid of their boundaries. Right. And they're going to give their authority to the beast. Wow. And they're going to have contact with the supernatural. If that's what was going on at Babel, and I think it was. Absolutely. Yeah. They wanted to. It's probably a ziggurat. It was. Well, that was a ziggurat, but yeah. you know after. The flood, yeah, and the cause of the flood was fallen angels crossing boundaries, right? And they were locked up. Now we've already talked about that, yeah. So what are they going to do? Well, we're going to build this tower. They want that tangibility. They want it back. They don't like what they lost. Right. Right. Okay. Yep. And so the seven years, dear listeners, they're getting what they've wanted. For millennia. They get that tangibility back. They want it. That's right. They long for it. Amen. They want to be rid of boundaries. That's right. They want to erase the distinction between the creator and the creation. Right. And they want a unified whole of the physical and the spiritual. Right. And so the universe is like this god or goddess that's in everything. Yeah. And that's what's going on. They won't have any problem. Once the rapture happens, they're... They're going to say, good, finally. Amen. That's that's exactly right. You know, Bob, too, as I'm thinking about this, it's interesting to think about how this concept of panentheism plays into their understanding of the rapture, how they'll explain it. It's almost as if the cosmos is rejecting us because of our intolerance. But what's interesting is Jesus Christ comes in the flesh at his first advent, a transcendent God becomes imminent, that is, he be, you know, with us through the the incarnation. Well, it's interesting 
is in First Thessalonians 4, it talks about how the Lord himself will descend with the shout of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. And so Jesus himself is going to come at his parousia. In fact, in verse 27 here of Matthew 24, where Jesus says, as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man. Yes. That term coming there is our term parousia. And what we've defined it as, for the listener's sake, is really that in encapsulates the entire 70th week. The parousia is the technical expression for the second advent of Christ. And so just as Christ's first advent wasn't simply one day, there was many days involved with it, the second advent is also a plurality of days. Okay, so am I right then to call that a complex event? Yes, I love that the, phrase. The term event is singular, Yep. but the whole of the event has complexities exactly. and time involved. That's right. And the, com- the whole complex of events is bracketed by the personal return, not some of some of some surrogate or some angel on behalf of Christ, but Christ himself. So Christ begins the parousia with his return to take the church home. Right. And Jesus promises this in John 14. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. So in my father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, there you may be also. Which is in heaven. Which is in heaven. That's where. So he's taking us to be with him. Well, then at the end of the 70th week, he takes us with him to set up his earthly kingdom. So during the millennium. Exactly. He is here, but it's That's right. clear what's going on. So the listener needs to realize when we talk about parousia, it's the seven-year time period that's mentioned in Daniel 9. But it's bracketed both in the beginning of it and at the end of it with the personal visitation of Jesus Christ, the living God. And there's going to be no mistaking it. And that's why Jesus uses those two imageries, one of the lightning and then one of the vulture. Okay, so I just thought of an analogy for a complex event. Yeah. That's current. uh, It's always seemed to be current. Right. In America, we have a presidential election every four years. Right. Okay, so... In a given year, say, well, this is the year of a of an election. Right. Well, the election, actually, you could say, well, it happens a certain day in November. Right. Good. But when we talk about the election of 2016 or the election of 2020. Right. There's campaigns. Well, we're right and... now, as we're recording, we're sitting here in 2019. Yeah. Every day on the news, somebody else is running for president. And right. Who's going to do that? We're not even into the year yet. Right. Good point. It's a process. But this is the 2020 election. Right. So there is an analogy for what a complex event looks like. That's a great example. Yeah. It's a whole series of things. Yeah. And Yeah. And you know, Bob, just proof that you and I are just reading into the text this. Jesus himself says this in Matthew 24. I believe it's verse 37. We're going to come to it where he says, as it was in the days of the Son of Man, so it will be at the parousia, or excuse me, so as it was in the... I'll read it. Oh, do you have it? Thank you. Yeah, Matthew 24, 37 says, for the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. Right, so what's interesting is there he talks about the parousia of the Son of Man is the term that he uses. Well, in Luke 17, 26, Jesus talks about the days of the Son of Man instead of the parousia. And the reason he uses the plural days is because just as what you've stated, Bob, it's a complex event. So the so parousia... Are the, so are the days of Noah. Exactly. That's exactly right. So the parousia singular is synonymous with the plural days of the Son of Man. And Luke's, in fact, they're parallel. They're identical in the Greek except that one change. Well, and as you said, the first advent is a complex event. Exactly. It certainly includes the virgin birth. That's right. It includes his sinless life. Yep. And so on his death on the cross, when I preach the gospel on Sunday, I say all these things. Absolutely. And his resurrection. Yes. And his appearance to witnesses and his ascension, Psalm 110. Yeah. So that's just how it is. But right. the amillennialists will say, no, 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 forget all of that. Too complicated. It's just that one thing that happens. Yeah. And, and it's sad because so many times 
Jesus in the Olivet Discourse describes these things. So when you see these things, he's always using the plural. So there's not just one event, there's a plurality of events. So for the listener's sake, when you think about the parousia, which is the technical term for the coming of Christ, put in your mind the concept of the entirety of the 70th week, bracketed by Jesus' rapture of the church, finished by his his coming with the church. Okay. That's the best way to understand because it. Because for the church comes with the church. Yeah. All right, now... Talking about that, and we mentioned it's not hard for us to see how the world will explain it. Right. The universe belched out all the <laughs> people who wouldn't get with the process of the Hegelian synthesis exactly. or whatever it is they believe. Right. But here, there's one more question, but I think it is addressed during that 70th week. So that's the Christians that are raptured. Yeah. But what about the Jews? Because they're just as much of a problem for this process as the Christians are, at least the believing Christians, right? Because they keep clinging to their Moses, their status yeah. as the people chosen who are the descendants of Abraham, right? And that's why Hitler wanted to be rid of them. That's right. They Good point. They wouldn't really assimilate. So I'm just going to ask you, Eric, being yeah. how you know so much about this. So the Christians go into rapture, but what happens to the Jews? Yeah, very interesting, Bob, because the promise is. This 70th week of Daniel is designed to bring all of the righteousness that God has promised for the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to be fulfilled in Israel. And so it's going to be a time of purging. So you're right. What's interesting is when you see the Christians leave, the Antichrist is also going to be dismayed with the Jews. Because at that point in the 70th week, they're going to have a temple in which they're going to worship a transcendent God who still gives the boundaries from the Mosaic Covenant, and the world won't tolerate that. Antichrist will hate it, because Antichrist is going to be this utopian who is going to supposedly bring perfection to earth. So he can't have the Jews' transcendent God get in the way, just as Adolf Hitler couldn't have the transcendent Jews get in his way for his Reich. Okay, that leads to, uh, to another question then. Yeah. Does the temple have to get rebuilt before the rapture? I don't think so. I don't, I don't either. Yeah, I don't think there's anything that, in fact, there may be a good case to be made to say the beginning of the 70th week may begin, obviously begins with the rapture, that I think there's probably some agreement made very quickly with this beast-like figure, this Antichrist, who so, says, look, the Jews are going to get their temple, we'll but there's give some... give you a temple. Right, and there's going to be some, there's going to be something they'll have to give up. Isn't there like a precedent with Herod's temple? Yes, yes, that's right. The second temple where Herod yeah. embellished it and made it as it was at the time of Christ. That's right, that's and then right. And Rome was destroyed in 70 AD. Exactly. Okay, so then, supposing these things happen, as it seems clear that they will. Yeah. Then, halfway through, Antichrist doesn't like the fact that they're worshiping Yes. The monotheistic creator. Exactly. And that's when he puts an end to it. And that's prophesied so, in Daniel 7 as well. And so what exactly does he do? So what he does is he desecrates the temple by setting himself up. He stops the laws. And we can read about this in Daniel 7 and also in Daniel 9, where, in fact, Jesus refers to it as the abomination that causes desolation. And the reason he refers to it as that is because when this pagan, this antichrist, sets himself up in the temple to be worshipped, it really causes the temple to be unusable in a sense because now you have idolatry within the temple itself. So what happens is Antichrist seems to be pro-Israel for the first three and a half years. In fact, there's peace, and that's why Jesus says there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. Uh, don't be alarmed. He says that in Matthew 24 early on. Mm -hmm. But it's at the midpoint where Antichrist, as you said, Bob, turns on them because he's sick of this transcendent God who still tells the Israelites that there are certain laws that are they're right and wrong, and he won't tolerate it. And in fact, the Apostle Paul himself says in 2 Thessalonians 2 that this Antichrist is going to set himself up in the temple to be God. Okay, so church is raptured. Now, they get, now the situation is going on, and the Jews think they have it okay. Yeah. Until... That happens. Right. And so the, the dying is primarily going on in the Gentile world. You lose a quarter of the earth's population at the fourth seal. But all of a sudden, when you get to the midpoint, the persecution starts 
against Israel. And it's the worst time period ever. And that's why Jesus says, look, if yeah. those days not be cut short, no flesh would survive yeah, for the sake of the elect. Scholars call that the Great Tribulation. That exactly. Part, from then on. That's right. And then it's Christ himself who ends up saving yeah. Israel and keeps the promises to the patriarchs. Amen. That's and right. And so that's what we are seeing from all these different scriptures from Old and New Testament. That's right. Okay. Now, having debated over the decades different amillennials, they just roll their eyes and say that this is all a bunch of contrived nonsense right. that you just come up with because you don't want to except the fact that the church is Israel and God's done with the Jews. Oh, right, right. And, you know, Bob, what's funny is you and I have proven this in various passages that that can't be true. And one of the passages you and I have used, you're the one who actually taught me this, and I think this is so insightful, is in Romans eleven twenty six when Paul says, all Israel will be saved. Mm-hmm. Two verses later, he says, they are enemies of the gospel for your sake. It can't be the church, or the church would have to be the enemy of the gospel. <laughs> you pointed that out years ago to me, and I thought, well, that is so insightful, because uh, if the church, as the amillennialists claim, um, if, if all, I'm sorry, if all Israel is the church, every believer, Jew and Gentile, as amillennialists claim, well, then how can believers in the gospel, Jew and Gentile, be enemies of the gospel? So what verse 28 of Romans 11 proves is that Romans 11:26, when it says all Israel will be saved, all Israel has to be national ethnic Israel. Right. Because they were the enemies that, of the gospel. Paul said they're beloved for the sake of the fathers. E- exactly. In fact, um, nine times before that, Paul uses Israel as national ethnic Israel. So you would have something. You so would God have, is keeping. Exactly. Promises to the fathers, which has to mean the patriarchs. Amen. That's right. Okay. So I think we are on solid ground to take the Bible for what it says. Yeah. And to take these things literally, we're not claiming that there may not be some way it works out that's slightly different. Yeah. And I've used the illustration of John the Baptist being the Elijah of Malachi. Right, right. But that's rare. Yeah. If you look at the first advent, yeah. Literalness is continual. That's right. That's right. Down and, to places and details and yes. people and Amen. And you know with that Elijah, what's interesting too is we have this um this coming of Elijah like figure that happens in the tribulation period mm-hmm. where you have Moses and Elijah the two witnesses. Well, it's interesting Moses, this one witness, he does the exact same thing that Moses did during the first exodus, he uh, affects the the rivers, he turns them into blood. Um, we have Elijah, this second witness, this Elijah-like figure, he shuts the rain off. So he does exactly what Elijah did. So what the, what, the God, what the biblical writers are doing, John, is showing you evidence in the text that these are Moses and Elijah-like figures. Now, why would it be important that we have two witnesses that are like Moses and Elijah? Well, Moses and Elijah were also on the Mount of Transfiguration because everything is established by two witnesses. Two or three as, witnesses exactly, yeah. as it says in Deuteronomy 19. And the third witness was God from heaven saying, Exactly. Christ, listen to him. Yeah, but the most important More witness. More than a witness, the actual <laughs> judge of the universe. Right, amen. So you have Moses who represents the law, and Elijah, which is the pinnacle of the prophets. So you have the witness of the law and the prophets that Jesus is the spokesman for God the mediator of the new covenant, but you also have them come again prior to the 70th week being completed is one last appeal by God for everyone to repent. That's how much God loves the world, that he sends two witnesses, yeah. even again in his long suffering, as his wrath is being poured out, he's using witnesses, the law and the prophets, to try to bring people to repent and come Amen. to Christ. Well, thank you, Eric. I Really appreciate your knowledge of these things, and it's fun to go through Matthew and take each verse for what it says. So next week we'll start with verse 29. Sounds great, Bob. Well, we're out of time for this edition of Critical Issues Commentary Radio. We want to remind all of you out there that you can access this program at our website at cicministry.org. Well, Bob, it's a blessing to talk about the great promises we have. I look forward to doing it next week. Amen. We want to remind all of you out there, as it says in Philippians 1.27, stand firm in one spirit, with one mind, and strive together for the faith of the gospel. 